problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Na mai hari mai and welcome to Sarah's Country. I'm your host Sarah Periam and here on Sarah's Country we like to talk about the matters that matter most to farming, food and fashion in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, the most beautiful paradise at the bottom of the world. Now, it's probably not surprising that a recent ASB survey has come out today, data that shows that being in the countryside is the best place to be because, of course, demand for food and fibre is not changing regardless of COVID and our border restrictions. Uh, And interestingly, in the latest quarterly regional economic scorecard, Manawatu Wanganui came out and topped the charts in terms of soaring employment, retail, uh, wages, new car sales even, construction, and of course, the big talk behind our GDP is, of course, the primary sector, the food production sector. I don't think I need to tell any of our listeners and our viewers that we know this already. We are living and breathing it every single day. And isn't this our opportunity to be able to continue to grow and build this story, our food and fiber story domestically to our own people? This is where I feel we need to do a lot more work because primary producers around the world are facing protectionism and nationalism within our markets. And so therefore it is uh, our role to be able to do the same, a lot to be able to celebrate because we all know where a lot of these regulations are coming from, don't we? Populist politics and uh, of course the urbanisation of New Zealand has certainly played in that direction. I'm looking forward to the interviews tonight to discuss a a lot about that. But I do want to hear from you throughout the show. If you're new to Serious Country, I'd love to say welcome. How we do this is live over the next hour. We have uh, some wonderful guests joining us. And then, of course, on demand on podcast, you can listen back throughout any of the individual uh, interviews as well. So if you're just in a bit of a rush, uh, you've got 10 minutes up your sleeve, downloaded podcasts or of course long drives uh, around this beautiful paradise that we call home and of course to our international guests welcome uh, you can get in touch with me at any time sarah at sarahscountry.com a new email address but really where i love to see and hear from you is in the comments live below if you are watching with us across the wonderful web and we do this in alliance with a fantastic team at farmers weekly who put huge energy into this in-depth journalism uh, to find more uh, around the stories that matter most so tonight i want to talk to you about about yeah, uh, it was after actually a a an interesting lady I met when I was out walking Dolly or go out on my uh, morning walk, um, and she was a landscaper, and we got talking about how lovely the lawn was on this speck build, uh, and she said you wouldn't believe the amount of money that's going into mitre teen bunnings landscapers because all these people who can't spend money internationally on their holidays is being redirected into their backyards um and you can just see it It, it's absolutely mental i'd love to know where is some of those things you've decided you that you'd love to get on board and uh, do up and renovate or uh you know something that you've uh, decided to spend your money more on um i've just been booking our new year's holiday with my group of friends and and of course, it's domestic. Um, and, you know, we're looking at different options because, you know, none of us have had an international holiday this year, probably not next year. Um, so, of course, we think, well, why not just um, go up another level or so and treat yourself? So I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but of course, sometimes it's about capital improvement, better spend going back into the farm, paying off debt someone that would love to pay off a bit of debt and help farmers. We're going to hear from uh, very shortly on the show. I'll get to that next. And turning to the stories we have tonight. After 720, hundreds of like-minded farmers have been working together alongside trusted experts and facilitated small groups as part of the Red Meat Profit Partnership. Uh, You may be one of those farmers who have uh, gathered a lot of great value 
from this initiative. Chair Malcolm Bailey is going to explain to us how this has resulted in a lift of annual total farm profits in a new uh, survey about nearly $100 million by 2025. So basically proving that the spend is worth it. Agri-Training is providing free retraining and support to Kiwis hit by unemployment due to COVID-19. And so we found uh, Mark Harden. He's a former Brit who is here in New Zealand. He's, had, he's got a very colourful CV. He utilised Agri-Training uh, to get the foundation skills and introduction into the primary sector and has landed himself a job. He's going to join us after 730 to close the show at quarter to eight, verified sustainable production right across supply chains is key to New Zealand's beef improving its standing on the world stage, says New Zealand Roundtable for Sustainable Beef Chair Grant Bunting. And looking forward to having Grant, who is also from ANSCO, join us following a field day last week whereby these pilot programs showcase how we can do it sustainably and profitably. Now, as I said, uh, looking to the indebted farmers, as he calls them. First up on the show, Green Party co-leader James Shaw uh, wants to transition farmers to more sustainable farming systems. And he believes this is a national challenge that he has set aside, or the party has set aside, $300 million. And this is to aid uh, this uh, should they get back into government post the election. All that coming up after the break and of course your comments, I'd love to know what are some of those things that you have decided to spend your money on and treat yourself when you can't of course go on those overseas holidays. I'd love to hear about your projects. Of course spring's coming up so what a great time um, to share with us what you're up to and we'll have James Shaw coming up after the break. This is Sarah's Country. for perfect beef and lamb. Take one small fresh country. Make sure it's nice and remote. Now, keep it at the ideal temperature all year round. Next, mix in the farmers. They go perfectly with the nature of this unique place. Add regular sprinkles of rain to really bring out the lush meadow grass. Then let your animals happily graze on this grass all day, every day. There you have it, New Zealand, the perfect recipe for beef and lamb. Taste pure nature. Aotearoa New Zealand has always been a land that has provided for its people. A land of abundance and opportunity. Our dedicated team at Ag Research know that embracing kaitiakitanga will see this continue for future generations. The work we do is transforming the way we farm 
and revolutionizing the way New Zealanders care for our animals and for our land. We work hard to create the world's most desirable food and bio-based products through smart, sustainable farming, led by some of the world's most phenomenal research and informed by the consumers who benefit from this passion. Through a focus on environmental sustainability and climate change initiatives, this passion will allow our work to continue for generations to come. Our proficiencies in research run wide, from seeds to pest control, high-value food production to practical farming systems and quality assurance. From the smallest rural land use project to international research programs, our science and technology innovations drive the prosperity of our precious agricultural sector. It's through this research that New Zealand retains its position as a scientifically advanced global agricultural leader. Our commitment to the growth of our wider New Zealand economy, its people, and the kaitiakitanga of Aotearoa is at the very heart of every scientific innovation and creation we deliver. Ag research. Firmly grounded in this land. These waters. Looking to what's in the stars and the future. Atamatai. Matai Fitu. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop and the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or horse feed. Or bee suits. Children. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But at Farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm... Grow. Milk. Dredge. Rear. Come on in. Because we're out here too. Welcome to Sarah's Country. For those who have just joined us, uh, thank you so much for coming on board if you are watching live across the world. Really appreciate you taking the time. And of course, for those on demand, wherever you are, I hope you are having a wonderful day. Now, our live audience, you do get the extra privilege of being able to join us live. And what I love is when you can send in some good questions for our guests coming up, particularly James Shaw from the Green Party and their $300 million uh, fund they've set aside to transition New Zealand farmers into regenerative and organic practices. There's a lot there that I do want to unpack with Minister Shaw very shortly, but I'm getting down now into your live comments, and I this is absolute favourite, I've got to say. Kate Taylor, we traded in the brother-in-law's 50th in Perth for a spa pool. Oh, Kate, what I'd do for a spa pool. And it kind of, can I tell you, I, I really, this is just on the bucket list. So it's kind of like the jet ski, isn't it? You can't do it and, you know, until you sort of can justify it. And like you said, it's a direct sort of luxury spend to luxury spend trade. Um, I don't want to get a spa pool while I'm in town. Because, you know, you get in the spa and you, you, I don't know, maybe it's just me yakking away and your voice is way too loud and the whole neighbourhood can hear what you're saying, especially if you had a few wines. I'm going to save that as my treat when I can get back out into the country. Um, a spa pool, a uh, spare money, sounds like a Tui ad. Yes, Jane, um, of course. Looks like the Coalition have already spent it for us. Uh, Shaw's Fert Tax and Parker's Power Trip. Well, 100%. Um, and we will understand a lot more about James Shaw's first tax coming up. Jock and I said, a trip to Fjordland on a luxury boat. Um, what a lovely idea, Jock. And uh, John is going to stock up the wine cellar. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we are taking your comments around. Are you redirecting some of that spend that you may be doing in terms of an international holiday? Are you paying back debt? Are you saving that? Or is that just an absolute fast? The reason we're discussing that is, uh, of course, ASB's uh, quarterly economic forecast report has come out. And it has basically said that the New Zealand economy is performing better than expected. Uh, and that business confidences seem to be bucking the trend, despite despite all of the e uh, economists' uh, predictions. Is that correct? 
I mean, we know in the primary sector things are a bit more buoyant than they are in certainly a lot of other industries that have suffered. I'd love to know what your thoughts are around that. And of course, uh, as we go to our guests, I'd love your questions. We have had a bit of a change around to our order while we get Minister Shaw on the line. Uh, we're going to go now to Chair of the Red Meat Profit Partnership, Malcolm Bailey, joins us now. Good evening, Malcolm. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Sarah. Hey, I was really stoked to get um, news of how positive the funding into the Red Meat Profit Partnership has been in terms of that flow-on effect back into the pockets of farmers. Can you tell us about how you commissioned um, this research and what the outcomes were? We used a firm called Scarlatti to do the analysis, which is draft at this stage because the real measurement of the effectiveness of RMPP will be measured in 2025. But at this point, it's showing a very strong return from the investment made by our various partners and the Crown. And we're very pleased with that. And in some respects, a return of $17 for every dollar invested looks too good to be true and so we asked Scarlatti to really validate that by looking at it in another way and that way was asking them to look at the difference between the top performing farmers and the farmers that aren't in the upper echelon and see what the difference in profitability uh, was between the two and we find that our returns are actually a comparatively small part of that difference meaning that there's every reason to believe that this is a genuine return. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with what the Red Meat Profit Partnership was initially in terms of uh, the vision and Sarah, what I can't outcomes. Hear you. <laughs> oh no uh, we're just having some technical difficulties can you hear me Malcolm? I've lost your audio. Okay, um, we'll just. Oh no, you're back, you're back. Now. Um, Sorry. So for, <laughs> for for those who are unfamiliar with the Red Meat Profit Partnership's vision and outcome originally, uh, take us back. Okay. Well, the whole concept is, is that we've got most of the major meat processes, plus beef and lamb, plus two banks, Rabobank and ANZ, as our partners, and the concept was to really try and get farmers who aren't performing at the, the highest level to and get closer to the top performance. And we also aim to also offer uh, benefits for the top performing farmers as well. So the whole concept really is just lifting uh, performance across the sector at farmer to farmer level that's uh, coming through with the action groups that we have formed and the whole idea is to share best practice and actually form action plans so that you follow through on, on good ideas and see that flow through to, to the bottom line of the farm business. Um, we're going to be joined by Grant Bunting uh, from the New Zealand Roundtable for Sustainable Beef towards the end of the show, Malcolm. And, and the New Zealand Farm Assurance Program has certainly um, been one of the projects that the Red Meat Profit Partnership has been working on. Providing benchmarks, is, have you found that being a very tangible, um, productive way that farmers can actually set goals um, when they can actually compare with each other? Sure. You know, there's an old saying, what you measure, you improve. So you actually do have to measure things and generate data, benchmark against others and see how you're performing relatively. And if you're a bit behind, there's an incentive to and a target you can set to do better. And so benchmarking is, is very, very important. And of course, in regards to the strategy of peer support, as opposed to being talked to, um, must have also be rewarding to see that it is reflecting in those numbers. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that while, you know, a lot of us farmers are very confident around things we do, there's a need to get reassurance mm -hmm. around some of these new ideas. And when it comes to spending money, I think farmers quite rightly say, well, I'm not just going to throw money at someone's great idea. I want some more assurance than that. And I think working with other farmers that may have already been there and done that is really important. So that that peer group that the farmers are in, they, they choose to be in a group with people they're comfortable with and they share common goals. And in many cases, and, and this is particularly relevant to 
some higher performing farmers that they have formed groups uh, focused on uh, looking after their catchment. So water quality and, you know, what's best practice around that. So there's a wide range of things and it might be a target for a year or two to work on something and then reset targets with a new goal. And it, it's a living thing. And one of the key things of the RMPP uh, overall program is that we wanted to ensure that these things will carry on beyond the funding life of RMPP. We don't want a flash in the pan. We want this to be a step change for the sector where farmers end up better off. It's interesting that you brought up there about catchment groups because, of course, funding into this is um, finite. But also, too, we are discussing a lot in terms of multi-land use and not being uh, segmented into silos of red meat, dairy, arable, etc. Uh, and the merge of catchment groups, is it peer support community group around that because there's a lot of things that uh, you know we've seen sheep and beef guys have learned from dairy in terms of pasture management etc and vice versa across other sectors how can we start to merge this style of learning um, collectively together so we're not doing duplication yeah, a feature of uh, our MPPP has been the overall uh, collab- collaboration with the dairy sector as well on some of the topics we've worked on. And I think you're making a really good point that we want to make sure that best practice is shared and it need not be just a red meat issue. It, it can go far wider. And we've got to take a New Zealand-wide approach to these things. And, you know, you, you've got... Other stories tonight with a minister who's driving some change, and these are big impacts on us. So the more we work together, the better from my point of view, and that means being prepared to share and pick up from from others. Yeah, it's interesting. We had uh, John Leyland Pino on, uh, chairing the Freshwater Leaders Forum last night, and uh, his whole approach was the top performing farmers, like you refer to, from an environmental standard, which uh, in turn um, he referred to as economically um, the top, are trying to basically get the bottom to come up. Um, Is there incentive for that from a profitability perspective? Or uh, are we going to continue to see larger farms just get larger as it gets too hard and the smaller farming families fall out the bottom? Well, I think if we look worldwide, there's been a trend for uh, average farm size to continue to increase, and that's driven by a number of factors and technology and, you know, bigger machines on some farms can be way more productive than um, small machines on multiple farms, this sort of thinking. So there's a trend there that we can't buck, but I have to say personally, I think that the so-called family farm concept we have in New Zealand has served us extremely well and I for one would like to see that continue albeit uh, it won't be quite the same as what we've we've had back in time and you know we have seen consolidation of farms into bigger ones and less farming families overall but um, you know our objective is to work to lift uh, profitability productivity they often go hand in hand and and, and, and that's the best thing we can do for keeping things um, family farm oriented, I think. Malcolm, lastly, before um, you go, I do want to talk around this being a part of succession too, because when you talk to the likes of um, Conrad at Property Brokers and people that are involved in the future farm um, ownership models and how things may change around succession. Uh, and that a lot of the, the younger generation coming through don't see farm environment plans as a threat to profitability and all of this types of regulations going on and that potentially couldn't can be opportune are you sort of starting to see that through that and who's participating within these groups and that there is um you know like a, a positive sort of I know there was an older farmer who said he got a second wind having a, an involvement with that younger youth etc around some of these issues and how it was possible to farm through yeah. Yeah, look, there's all sorts of outcomes, and we actually, within our MPP, we have had uh, succession planning seminars, particularly our banking partners have been keen to to run those, and I think th- there's a whole mix of things, but it, succession is um, something that can be really tricky with farms, but it's our view that it's healthy to provide opportunities for the next generation, and helping people figure out 
best way to do that is, is very important. And, you know, there's not, nothing magic. We've, we've got quite old farmers who are performing at a great level and, you know, it's not about them having to move on. It's it's working with them and others to, as she said, you know, some of that crossover between younger and older people is, is very positive. So there's no one size fits all here and we, we just really want to promote um, people to think about what they're doing, how they're going about it, and making sure that they have an enjoyable life as well. That's really critically important. Mm, absolutely. Thank you so much, Malcolm Bailey, uh, Chair of the Red Meat Profit Partnership. And fantastic to see that funding will continue for the next six months, um, of course, with COVID being a, a huge interruption, because as the report out has said, it's going to contribute to an increase of over $100 million by 2025 into on-farm profitability. Fantastic to see that that is uh, a part of our future. Now, whilst we continue to get Minister James Shaw on the line, uh, we are going to cross now to Mark Harden after the break. Mark was a part of the free retraining by Agri Training here in uh, Canterbury, and it's provided to those Kiwis that have been hit hard by unemployment. Mark has had, he even sent me his CV, it's, it's, a, it's a, a fantastic read. Um, we're going to understand about Mark's background and how he found work in the primary sector. It's a great story, all that coming up on Sarah's Country. We're a large deer farm and very proud deer farmer at that. I grew up here as a little boy. It is just an, an amazing lifestyle. I, I could never live in the city ever again. Just the big open spaces and just the peacefulness of it all. I think deer are very majestic, very intelligent animal. Having deer that are under pressure or anything like that or overstocked, you know, they really don't perform as well. You should really be spreading them out on beautiful pastures. Keeping them happy, a happy deer is a, is a good deer. And good feed, you know, good grass. We renew our pastures all the time in the paddock, so we're always getting the best quality grass. Well, I guess in the wild, though, they don't have the luxury of the grass that we put in front of them here as a farmed animal. I believe that we've got some of the best English type deer in the country, if not the world. And to associate our brand with Silverfern Farms brand is, um, works for us. Without the likes of Silverfern Farms, then there's no point doing this. So they're very, very important for us. I'm Mark Tapley, very proud suppliers, venison to Silverfern Farms. I'm loving these comments below here um, and we're talking about, you know, any particular overseas um, uh, holiday funds going into any particular. Campbell has said, uh, updated the old tractor, 350 to a 500 power steering. Uh, still got the second hand one, but oh, what a luxury. Good on you, Campbell. And Campbell is going on to continue to talk about, yeah, I did see that story. Three to four times the value um, organic is fetching in certain places. And they're saying that regenerative agricultural defined and accredited products could potentially, and in this COVID economic environment, who is going to pay for that? Um, but is it our market access? It's a, it's a developing story. Now, I do have some sad news uh, for those who were super looking forward to Minister James Shaw joining us. Um, we've been bumped, but that's okay because that's just what happens. You know, it's electioneering time and uh, there's multiple places that they would love to talk to. Um, it, it potentially could be a bit of an administration um, stuff up. It won't be anything to do with his value of talking to the agricultural sector over others. Um, and uh, I know James is a good man and, and we will work on getting him back. But I have two fantastic gentlemen to talk to that I can for multiple um, <laughs> 
hours, I'm sure. Um, and particularly our next guest, I'm very much looking forward to joining us. I'm going to bring up his CV he sent through to me. So Agri Training, we've had Matt Jones on Sarah's Country in the past and absolutely passionately off their own back have been providing incredible Agri Training um, to those coming into our sector. And as we know, we have a labour shortage in our industry and yet we have growing numbers of unemployed off the back of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and this free training has got many success stories and they've provided the wonderful Mark Harden who joins us now. Good evening, Mark. How are you? Can you hear me? Sarah, yeah. for inviting me on. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you so much. Mark, for those of us listening from the Northern Hemisphere, can you clarify exactly where that wonderful accent is from? Yeah, I'm from Scotland. Yeah, there'll be a little bit of a delay on the line here because I'm in Springfield. We're away out near the mountains, so it's taken a while to get down to you. Oh, you're but not... I'm from Scotland, Edinburgh. Oh, fantastic. Absolutely. So how long have you been in New Zealand, Mark? Been here for 16 years. We came in 2004. And I've just opened up your wonderful CV here. You've done a huge amount of things across the spectrum in regards to um, jet boat tours and being a skipper and crew. How did you find yourself in a predicament with employment and lead you to agri-training? Uh, well, it was a familiar story, unfortunately, this year in that uh, COVID-19 um, decimated my industry. I was a captain on a, a seismic survey vessel, um, seismic survey company out of Norway. And uh, unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic caused the, the price of oil and gas to fall dramatically. So made uh, crew changes impossible. So we couldn't go around, around the world, the world to, join to join our ships. Our ships. Uh, so, uh, so all, all the, company the company ships are now currently laid, laid up and, up and have been, been for over six, six seven, seven months, months now. now. So, uh, well, I, was I was laid off, off and, and not being not a youngster, a youngster it's, it's kind of difficult, difficult to get, get into, into a, a new industry at sea because they're all looking for younger people to train up through the ranks. Seismic survey is a very specialised industry. Um, so yeah, I, got, I ended up uh, without a job. And uh, just, I, I think it was on Facebook, something popped up in front of me and said, uh, you fancy doing agriculture? So I, uh, I thought, well, that's not going to go away. We're always going to feed the world from New Zealand. And so I jumped in. Where were your family based in New Zealand at the time? Uh, we were here in uh, Springfield. So we haven't, we haven't had to move. Um, I did the Agri-Training uh, Foundation. I did the webinar first, which was a four-day, uh, four-hour webinar each day, which was a real good insight into what was available and you know just a little bit of a taster about what the agriculture industry is and I think we all it's a little bit like seafaring seafaring people know their ships out there but they're not really very sure what they do and it's a little bit the same as agriculture mm. um we all know there's farms out there but we really know very little about the work and what goes on on them and so I was lucky enough to be chosen uh, from the webinar to move into the two-week um intensive foundation course in Winchmore which was was amazing it really was amazing that's really fascinating in terms of, uh, and absolutely, you're so right. It's like so many other industries that I am not in every single day. I mean, I've just been fitting out an office, Mark, and dealing with subcontractors in the building industry. Oh, my goodness. It's a whole foreign world to me. Um, but in particular, with that taster course, what did you take away from that webinar, you know, four days, four hours a day, that made you go, wow, this industry is a lot more to it and then I thought and your preconceived ideas yeah it, it, it was it was a really um a real eye-opener for me and I think everybody else that was on the webinar as well it was um a huge range of people were there talking to us and giving us some insights into farming in general not just dairy there were sheep and deer and arable uh, pigs honey honey bees it, there was all sorts of things and um, the main thing for me was that it's it's longevity. Um, you know, you go into agriculture, and I think from the people that were talking to us, people have been there for 30, 40 years. You know, ever since they were kids, they went straight onto farms and worked their whole lives. And, you know, to get an opportunity to get in and join that, at my age, I'm 
I'm 60. So to get an opportunity to get in there and join that seemed seemed too good to pass up. Um, and, you know, I like to think I made a reasonable impression and I got chosen to go on to Winchmore. And so when you went into that two weeks, what was that next step to have that foundation skill set to lead you into your new role? Yeah, it was really, really important. Um, the guys at Winchmore and Agri Training did an amazing job. They they set up all kinds of visits for us to go around to different kinds of farms from, you know, uh, beef farming, sheep farming, deer up in the high country, uh, dairy farming, of course. We even won a sheep milking farm, which I believe is the only one in the South Island. I think there's some up north there. Um, fascinating stuff. And, you know, by the end of the first week, I wanted to be a dairy farmer, a deer farmer, a honeybee keeper, a pig farmer. I wanted to do the whole lot. It was all, it was all so exciting. Um, but, you know, I, I went in with a, with a health and safety background from being at sea. You know, our health and safety at sea was very, very intense. And so I always had that in mind. And going into the, the agriculture, into the, the foundation course, I realized that you know, health and safety is quite an important part of the whole thing. Uh, so I was... Uh, yeah, I sort of made that known and, you know, before the two week was up, I had an interview with compliance partners down in uh, up in Christchurch, they're based in Christchurch in Timaru and Ashburton, and uh, I was offered a job in health and safety and we deal with loads and loads of farms in compliance partners, so it was an ideal fit for me, it was really perfect. Oh, they would have loved seeing you coming because, um, of course, it's a rising uh, part of our industry and more and more so, your skill sets would be fantastic to have on board um so, so a, a wonderful story i'm just actually i would love to go back through i'd love to come up the waimakariri river with you by the looks of um your skill set throwing a jet boat around is one of them but tell us about sorry this is this is irrelevant but it's fantastic it's not often you look at someone's cv and they used to be a presenter on bbc and an antiques based tv show Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit different, a little bit out there. Well, that came about because I was I was an auctioneer in Scotland for a long time. I had my own auction company, and uh, you know we were selling all sorts of stuff, antiques included. And the only program on the t- on the telly at the time uh, to do with antiques was Antiques Roadshow, uh, and there was another one called Bargain Hunt. And uh, I made a little demo video with a company out of London. I made a little demo of me being an auctioneer and how it was easy to do and furnish your house for next to nothing, that sort of thing. And, and you know, the, the demo video went around a few different places and it landed on the right desk on the right day when the presenter from Bargain Hunt, David Dickinson, decided that he was not going to do the new Flog It program called Flog It. And uh, the, present, the producers phoned me up and said, can you be in Bristol tomorrow? So I said, okay, okay. Uh, and I jumped on a plane and went down and they interviewed me and they said, right, you got the job. And so I presented the first five episodes of Flog It on BBC Two. Um, I've just had a, a question come in here from one of our regular viewers um, saying that my question earlier was too challenging. So I'm just going to change that for the rest of the show. And uh, I would love to know from our viewers and from you, what is the most interesting antique you've ever had in your hands? Wow, that's a good one. Um the most interesting one, I tell you, we we, uh, we dealt with a lot of different companies, and Pickford's was one of them. Um, big, It's a huge removals con- company worldwide, and they have storage facilities all, all over the world. And one day, quite early on in my auctioneering career, they brought in an old captain's trunk. Uh, it's called a Saratoga trunk. It's one with a little domed top, and it's got, like, wooden straps across the top and around the sides. Really old-fashioned Victorian trunk. And we thought, oh, nice trunk. Uh, but I opened it up, and inside it was all the belongings of somebody who had done the, the, the grand tour. You know, back in Victorian times in the 1850s and 1860s, the young well-to-do women particularly would go on the grand tour around Europe on horseback and in carriages, and they would draw and do art and have all fancy clothes and do embroidery, and they would take their whole wardrobe with them, and that's what was in the Saratoga trunk. It was an absolutely fascinating snapshot of life 150 years ago, from dresses and underwear to jewellery, and there was 30 or 40 watercolours, and it was just fascinating, really fascinating. But that, that was probably the most 
Imagine uh, uh, loading that onto uh, Boeing going across the world today. How absolutely it's fascinating. It's Mark, thank you so much for yeah. joining us. It's, it is fantastic to see our industry through your lens. And um, we're so excited that you are a part of the primary sector. So welcome on behalf of myself and all the listeners and viewers on Serious Country. Uh, because And all the great the work that the team at Agri Training are doing off their bat to bring people into this industry in what is an approachable way. So I really appreciate your time. That's Mark Harden there who's been through the Agri Training uh employment webinar as he said and then of course going on to that foundation course absolutely fantastic i'm just going down to these comments that are coming in we good morning we have some morning viewers from around the world fantastic to have you and uh of course yeah, john's challenging me on my challenge i'd love to know what is the most interesting antique that you've ever had in your hands my far grandfather kept a lot of history from the gold mining days in central Otago and particularly the Loban Hotel that is, was flooded by Lake Dunstan. And I remember he, he used to have this, um, dad used to call it the Mitre 11 because if you couldn't get it at Mitre 10, you'd get it at granddad's dump called Mitre 11 because he hoarded everything. And there was some fascinating um, antiques and bits and pieces. And the one thing I have is an old sack from Canterbury Meat Packers um, is a little bit of a, a something that I was given as an antique. I'd love to know. I love talking about antiques and collecting things. So, of course, um, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, after the break, we're going to cross to chair for the New Zealand Roundtable for Sustainable Bee following their field day up north last week. Uh, and right, like here at our Huntley Service Centre. And here in Canterbury, we've got a self-service silo, so I can pick up fit when it suits me. And here in Morrinsville, we've got a world-class mill. That means that we can safely deliver our customers with the freshest, highest quality feed and minerals. It's about putting the customer first because that's what drives our business. We've been focusing on faster turnaround of orders. We've got to get the right products to the right places at the right times. Here in Taranaki, we've got New Zealand's only urea manufacturing plant. It's where we create our premium sustained fertiliser. We're supplying nationwide and working locally. By getting to know you and what you want to achieve, we can help you get there. And with the new My Balance platform, Balance has put my farm at my fingertips. In fact, we offer support in all sorts of ways, sharing the best nutrition practice with farming families across the country. Whether we're talking about animal health, farm productivity, or looking after our natural environment, sustainability underpins everything we do. We use our local expertise and the latest tools to help farmers and growers navigate the changing regulations so you can leave your farm in great shape for the future. And we can be really accurate avoiding areas like wetlands and waterways with our award-winning Spread Smart Tech. It makes the job far safer, more efficient and gives you the best results. When you've got access to that kind of know-how, you've got the support you need to make sure you're farming sustainably. It's that kind of thinking that'll keep us going for generations to come. Together creating the best soil and feed on earth. Really pleased we got into this. Thanks for your help, Dave. It's a good idea, honey. You reckon it'll come out? Cover it in talcum powder, to leave it 10 minutes, and you'll be fine. Good call, Dave. Good call on getting those security cameras, Dave. You call a new one yet? Yeah, kind of. When you've got decisions to make, we'll be there to help you make the right call. I'd go for those ones, Bob. Yeah, good call. Did you choose these? Oh, you know. For great advice and insurance, talk to FMG. Just thinking, um, Joel, you know, the, the wonderful history in Northern Ireland. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing over to you. Uh -huh. you know, what interesting heirlooms does the Rock family have? Ooh, heirlooms. Well, so there's the Rock coat of arms that my Granny Rock and Granny Granda Rock have up in the house um, that I think the council gave. I can't remember, but there's the Rock coat of arms, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then whenever uh, I got a great, or my great granda gave me a half penny, which was uh, quite a cool one. Um, I don't know. We don't. We don't know. I can't think of Joanne much. Rock. Please save him. Uh, yeah, in she, the comments she, she'll, below. Have, she'll have better ideas. <laughs> <laughs>
I believe somewhere that my great grandfather was one of the um, top men in Freemasons in this country, and there's all these very interesting secretive heirlooms lying around. <laughs> I don't know, um, but it's very interesting, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to <clears throat> excuse me have some fun with our next guest on that. Uh, last week there was a wonderful field trip that I wasn't able to go to. I was very gutted near Taupo uh, with the New Zealand Round Table for Sustainable Beef. Um, organised by our next guest, uh, Chair Grant Bunting, also from Ansco, who joins us now. Good evening, Grant. Hi, Sarah. Now, this article that Annette Scott's put up on farmersweekly.co.nz is really highlighting the pilot work that you've done with six farms to move towards more verified sustainable beef. What I'm really interested in is these defined standards for New Zealand. What do they look like? Well, the standard itself is an adaptation on the on what's commonly known at the moment as NZFAP. So NZFAP, for want of explanation on the acronym, was born out of uh, RMPP. Mm. And it dates back probably two or three years ago now where all meat companies had their own farm assurance programs. And we sought to adopt the national standard, essentially. Um, and those basic fundamental farm assurance programs were were born about, I think, historically on the requirements out of the UK for um, export lamb. The evolution of that has seen us evolve what is the basic NZFAP. And there is an acronym issue here, but NZFAP plus seeks to overlay sustainable values on what is a basic uh, farm assurance program as it stands now. Okay, well, smacking the heads of the red meat sector together is probably second um, to the bottom of doing it with the wool industry, let's be honest, Grant. But this pilot program is 50-50 funded between MPI and industry with, of course, Ansco Foods, Silver Fern Farms, Greenlee, and the likes of McDonald's and World Wildlife Fund, uh, among others. When you were talking there about the farm assurance program, I remember doing an interview with David Surveyor, CEO for alliance group who i see now have come to the table and and there was a lot of dismissal of this farm assurance program at the start by the processes that we have our own ours are far superior yeah. than the national standard and that air of arrogance around it where are we at now well i think historically there probably was grounds whereby those assurance programs were deemed to be reflective of competitive advantage the, the reality is the market the global market anyway now was is somewhat united in their expectations. So it's it's a space that I think we increasingly feel comfortable in uh, collaborating because uh, essentially we're all seeking to meet the same standard. So, um, hey, we were no different. ANSCO had its own farm assurance program for many years. And, um, yeah, um, I think it's great to see the fact that, um, you know, everyone's moved past that now. Uh, we can all agree on a common common basis and the evolution of that with a view to sustainability I have to say at the moment that that element's still very voluntary um, so this is still a draft standard the sustainable component um, and there's still some water to go under that bridge but the six farmers that participated in the proof of concept um, have been complemented by uh, I think another 35 farmers that also participated in a pilot for RMPP and, and those farmers collectively have basically said about saying, look, you know, h- how difficult or, or how hard is how hard is it to expand upon what we're already currently doing, with a view to meeting a standard that you know arguably is a stretch, um, but there's no doubt about it. The market is signalling very clearly that in time to come, there is an expectation that we will be able to demonstrate sustainable practice on farm. Okay, I want to bring this down to the nuts and bolts, which is the numbers. And we've had Jane Smith write in to say, you know, um, with Shaw's Furt tax and, um, as she says, Parker's power trip, and uh, she's re- referring to essential fresh water. How do we stay in the black to be green? And what were some of those outcomes from those pilot programs, from the profitability, when there hasn't been a defined uh, exponential premium on this particular program back to farmers? Yeah, well, I think the key thing to remember here is farm assurance is is reflective of market eligibility, right? Yeah. And, it, and it's very different from regulatory compliance. 
Um, we would like to think in time um, one begets the other. But certainly at the moment, um, from a farm assurance perspective, all we're seeking to do is demonstrate the requirements that our customer base wants to see by way of our product. Um, you know, there's no requirement at the moment from a farm assurance program perspective necessarily to meet the de domestic regulatory framework. Um, and, you know, and I think we've got to be very clear on that because the customer base, you know, their expectation is, well, one would argue reflective of consumers. And, and it's increasingly more about what's required to satisfy market eligibility as opposed to having to meet a hurdle or a requirement that might be imposed. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have Minister James Shaw make it onto the show, and I'm, I'm uh, being told in my ears that they certainly will be on, and they're very apologetic for not coming on. There's been um, a bit of discussion in the comments, Grant, about um, being able to achieve a three to four times price uh, for defining regenerative uh, farming in terms of the produce. Do you believe that that is possible from the market, especially when regenerative is hard to define in the likes of organic? Oh, look, I, I find it very hard to believe. I don't even think the market knows what regenerative ag is. Um, it's a piece of work that under the auspices of the round table, we've flagged up as seeing, is this a role we can play in defining that? Um, but, you know, I, I find that hard to fathom. Uh, you know, what is regenerative agriculture? I, I, I've, I've, I'm yet to understand myself what the extent of that is. It can be bent and shaped relative to whatever arguments being made. Don't get me wrong. I think I think there's something to it. Um, but I, I don't think the market certainly hasn't defined it. Um, I don't think industry's defined it. I think we're all grappling with it. And it's, a, it's just a convenient term at the moment if we're not careful. Yeah, but at the same time, sometimes when um, US actors and government officials continuously refer to a term over and over again, it does become oh, a part yeah. of our industry and something we should be focusing on. Um, it does make it hard when it is a, a method and a mindset um, towards farming in your own particular ecosystem that can't be defined by marketing. So it is a real challenge. Oh, look, it has to be defined. I, I certainly don't dispute that. Um, I'm not. I just don't think it's going to be particularly easy. Um, again, those sound bites that often those um, parties that are, you know, are subject to the publicity capture. Um, you know, the devil's in the detail a lot of the time, and and it absolutely has to be defined. But uh, you know, I find it difficult at the moment. Certainly, if I take, if I just put, you know, my ANSCO hat on specific to what our marketers are translating to us. They're, tra they're translating a strong message around sustainable farming practices, uh, and that's being over overlaid with the reference to regenerative. Um, but you know, we're not seeing we're not seeing an urgency around quantifying what that is yet. Yeah, okay. I, I would, so, I would, yeah. so I'd love to ask you quantifying what is the word sustainable and sustainable beef then, and it's deter and and it's um a, a part of the round tables uh, objectives. Well, in the first instance, it's very much at the moment around demonstrating intent. Um, so a lot of the work that's gone at the moment is around behaviour. Um, and sustainable, it's split into three or four categories whereby you give uh, consideration to farm practice, biodiversity, you, you know, people, community and the likes, right? So they're, they're largely generic in their reference, but they're framed in that sense, right? Um, and and really the insistence at the moment is really the messaging is, look, there's an acceptance that people may not have necessarily achieved, but there is an absolute requirement to demonstrate intent. And, and that's where this group of farmers we were fortunate to deal with, you know, they grasped that quite quickly. There was there was not necessarily a fear of being of pass or failure because it's not it's not whether you pass or whether you fail. It's whether you can demonstrate one that you're aware and that you have an understanding that it's changing, and two, that you're willing to consider that and demonstrate and practice that you're actually prepared to contemplate what might be a requirement that is only going to become is only going to evolve. 
Do you think that that will be how we go with um, an approach to fresh water? That if we can demonstrate that we're on the right track, we may not have to be forced to um, have consent for every activity on farm grant. Well, I think I'm much better suited to this side of the <laughs> argument than politics. To be fair, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'd like to think common sense will prevail, but. It's not common, is it? That's the problem. That's a very good point. And you know where you're also very well suited, Grant, um, and this is from a viewer comment, is actually of your question. Um, when will Grant be making those cool market update videos again? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, to be fair, they, they, we'll have to wait till the yellow card's rescinded. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You're being you're being missed from social media, Grant. Isn't that <laughs> yeah. such a compliment? <laughs> Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, fantastic, Grant. I really appreciate you coming on tonight and uh, the work that you're doing there with the New Zealand Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Uh, it's all about um, continuing the conversation, and that's what we love to do here on Serious Country. I'm absolutely, uh, Grant, actually, before you go, do you have any particular family heirlooms that you uh, have an under lock and key to be able to share with <laughs> us as we're talking about this tonight? I've got some great ones down here in front of me. Uh, no, not that I can, not, nothing that I've noted I can recall, no. <laughs> no, I'd like to say we did, but uh, yeah, nothing that would be all that notable. Oh, yeah. well, well um, that, you know, I'm going to get down into this. Um, Michael said he purchased the first map of Aotearoa on its own by a European in Melbourne. It's now in the Alexander Turnbull Library forever. Well done, Michael. And, Joe, are you looking at the comments? Uh, no, not right Is now. this breaking news? Is your mother um, pulling my leg? Oh, what she said. Apparently you've got the original plans for the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? I, I wish that was true. I don't <laughs> think that's true. But if we do, then why, why am I working here? We should be rolling in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course, um, Belfast, a home to uh, the building of the Titanic and the connection there. Fantastic to have you involved in the show live throughout the world here on Sarah's Country. And, of course, for those listening on demand, we absolutely love having you with us. Send me an email at any time. Sarah at Sarah'sCountry.com is the email. And, of course, wherever you follow on social media, make sure you can drop into the uh, slip into the DMs anytime you like. Of course, we're produced in alliance with the fantastic team at Farmers Weekly and you can catch the latest if you subscribe to My Daily Digest, uh, an inbox, an email into your inbox every day with the latest headlines. And of course, your wonderful Farmers Weekly hitting your mailboxes at the start of the week to keep you informed and uh, the most in-depth agri-journalism in this country. It's been an absolute pleasure having you to join us. We'll be back doing this again tomorrow night from 7 o'clock. And in the meantime, good night and go well. This is Sarah's Country.